Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Medical Talk. Today we have with us Dr. Hamad Malik. Dr. Hamad is currently a transition year resident at the Metro West Medical Center and he was also a postdoctoral research fellow at the Mayo Clinic and we are very excited to have him here today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me Anusha. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I would like to start the conversation by talking a little bit about your early life. Where were you born and raised and what was your early education like? Sure. So I was born and raised in Lahore, Pakistan. I went to Lahore Grammar School for my kindergarten till O-levels. After I finished my O-levels, I wanted to go into FSC. So I went to the Government College University Lahore and I did my FSC pre-medical from 2013 to 2015. And after that, I was very fortunate to get accepted into this combined military hospital Lahore, CMS Lahore, Pakistan, and Institute of Dentistry. Over there, I finished my MBBS education in 2020. My year of graduation is 2020, but because of the pandemic, it was pushed back to a few months, so opens up into 2021. Mm -hmm. But um, around the time of graduation, after that, I was very fortunate to get a position over here, and the rest is something that I'm still exploring and discovering. So that's a bit of background about me. So why did you choose to do medicine? So surprising thing, I actually had three life decisions I wanted to choose outside from like, you know, medicine was amongst them. So to help people, that's the basis of what I wanted to do. You know, my parents are both doctors that definitely inspired me and, you know, just seeing them being able to help so many people make a difference and make an impact. That was definitely something I saw growing up. So that really touched a chord in my heart. And after that, my grandfathers were both in the army as well. So I wanted to see that path as well. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I always wanted to be an army officer and I wanted to go join the army. So that was something that I thought would help me, you know, follow the footsteps of my grandfathers and be able to help people. But then I realized that, you know, there's more ways and serving the army is something amazing, but there's more ways to help people than, you know, the army. The other option I thought was, I also loved debates. When I was in government college, I started debating. Mm -hmm. um, me and my one of my really good friends, Kulam Muhammad, we were the ones who ran the Model United Nations Society. And we were very actively involved in public speaking, parliamentary style debates. And that really also affected me. So at a point I decided I want to do international relations and you know come work in the United Nations here in New, well, in New York City and be a diplomat so that was another option as well and then you know I just thought that you know that's a great venture but I feel like politics is not really my cup of tea I want to help people but I feel like in this cyber situations it's less about diplomacy and more about political association so I'm not really someone who favors supporting one party or another because of their political economical social aspects I believe in equality, justice, and equity. So, you know, ultimately, all these decisions were taken into account, and I made the right decision that I want to do medicine, and I want to be able to help people. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very happy and humble, very satisfied with the decision I made, and I love what I do. That's really interesting. So why did you decide to practice medicine in the US? So the specialty which I was exposed to early on during my medical school was um you know neurosurgery that's what i really liked and that's what i wanted to you know learn more about i think the biggest reason was the fact that my grandfather had a stroke and that was something that was very life-changing for me and i wanted to learn more about that so i learned about neurology neurosurgery and how most strokes originate from the heart cardiovascular strokes so I just kept learning more and more about that. And I was very fortunate to get an elective in the United States when I was in my third year of medical school. Mm -hmm. So I came here and I was rotating in the cardiology department, just understanding about, you know, ischemic strokes and cardiovascular diseases. <clears throat> and one of the interventional cardiologists was also working with the interventional radiologist. Mm -hmm. And when I was working and shadowing him, I got a chance to see the interventional radiologist. And that's something that was very interesting. I really like this idea that you can perform procedures in a minimally invasive manner mm -hmm. and, you know, patient can come in and go out the same day or even the next day. 
And that was something that really piqued my interest. After my elective, I came back and I realized that there is a very limited number of programs in our country that offer a very, very excellent interventional radiology program. Mm. So I spoke to my professors and my mentors and my teachers in medical school, and I wanted to learn more about the specialty. And I spoke to one of our professors, his name was Dr. Arif Kayyum, very few people who was both board certified by the United Kingdom and the United States. So I spoke to him and I asked him, Professor, in your experience, which system is better for more qualified training? Is it the UK system or the US system? And in his own words, oh, the US is more superior. <laughs> so that was definitely something to take into account. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think my long-term goal is to bring these resources and, you know, my knowledge, my skill sets back home to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be someone who can have the most exposure, to have the most resources, and ultimately carry it forward. I spoke to my professors in the United States as well. And I think that's when I knew I want to be able to travel, uh, sorry, I want to be able to train in the United States mm -hmm. and then get the best skill set. And then after that is done, ultimately bring it here and improve the state of affairs. So that's my long-term goal. And that's my journey to why I want to do it in the United States. That's a really good goal. I hope that you can bring it to Pakistan and improve the interventional radiology here as well. During medical school, you went to the U.S. and then you decided that you want to practice here in the U.S. and specialize from here. So did you start using the step one and step two resources at that time and focused on that exam during your medical school? Yeah, so I think around the third year, when I after I went for my elective, that's when I realized I really need to get my affairs in order and start studying for these exams. And I spoke to a bunch of seniors and, you know, they said that the earlier you start, the better you get. My brother was also someone who informed me of that. And I think <clears throat> a lot of students just don't realize the importance of this. But the sooner you start, the quicker you can get familiar with the topics and the resources. I'm not saying that, you know, people have different timelines. Some want to start studying after graduation. Some have you know, other commitments, they want to do good in medical school. That's all fair. That's all ultimately everyone's own individual choice. Mm -hmm. But I think starting early on and getting familiarized with the resources is something that really helps. Yeah. So I started my preparation in my third year of medical school. And I, I was very, very foolish to have started with the Kaplan series, which is by far a very outdated resource. And I do not recommend anyone to use it. I do not think it is a good resource. It might have been a good resource, but here's the thing about medicine and knowledge, Anusha. Mm -hmm. A good resource is only as good as at the time being. When more advances, better techniques, better resources become available, it is not the wisest decision to continue using those resources when you have better resources available that can help you improve. Mm -hmm. So that's my logic behind it. Mm -hmm. So I started out with my third year by reading the Kaplan series and around my fourth year, I started, started using some question banks and just progressed on to that. So my step one, step one studying officially started from my fourth year of medical school. I used the Kaplans and I used the question banks. And then by my final year, I was able to be well prepared and I was able to give both my exams. Did you just use Kaplan and the question banks or any other resource as well? No, 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 no. I used a lot of resources. I So I like to do things by trial and error. Mm -hmm. So I started out with Kaplan, wasted almost a year doing those things and did not find them to be very useful. Mm -hmm. Then afterwards, I was, uh, came across this uh, series called Boards and Beyond. Excellent, excellent series. Dr. Ryan is a wonderful teacher. Yeah. I recommend everyone who's going to watch this podcast or who's in MS1, MS2, start reusing re his resources because he teaches everything, physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, and moving on to the clinical side, the pathology, pharmacology, and even biostats, so, which is a subject for fourth year for those of you who are watching who are in their MS1s and MS2s. So Boards and Beyond, hands down, the best series to prepare for these steps. 
excellent, excellent, and most importantly, concise and focused yeah. specifically to the United States medical licensing exams. Mm -hmm. So I use Kaplan's and I used USMLE RX, which is a question bank made by the first aid team. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial phase of my preparation. I started using boards and beyond series and I started supplementing it with first aid. Mm -hmm. And once I started doing that more and more regularly, I was reviewing the lectures. Mm -hmm. I was um what's it called practicing the questions that's when i started to see an impro a progress and improvement in my scores mm -hmm. and i think alongside the first aid book so yeah let's let's get into the resources so hands down quality over quantity mm -hmm. so i think the four best resources are the only ones a person should use which is number one the first aid usmle step one first aid Beautiful book. I still use it to this day. Sometimes the concepts are so wonderful. I even use it in my residency because it's concise, it's straightforward, and it's very, very easy and fun to read. Number two, Boards and Beyond. Excellent. Excellent. Number three, Pathoma. Very, very good. And I think alongside Pathoma for micro and pharmacology, sketchy medicine. That is perhaps the best resource i still remember the side effects of drugs because of those resources and it's really really fun it's like a picture cartoons you watch them when you're having you know a long day or stuff like that so that's really useful so that's like the academic side so like for reviewing knowledge boards and beyond mm -hmm. first aid pathoma and sketchy medicine that is it if there's something else that you don't understand, you can always use a YouTube resource. There's wonderful teachers online in, in the YouTube, like Khan Academy, Osmosis, or Shamos Biology, or something you know similar. So whatever you like, you can use it. Mm -hmm. Then after that, when it comes to practicing, this is where I hammer down. I recommend everyone. You can study a book 12 times, but if you're not practicing the questions, you're not retaining, you're not learning. Until you start, start solving things in a problem-based manner, you won't be able to apply that knowledge. So that is where question banks come in. And I think the two best question banks <clears throat> are AMBOSS and UWord. Mm -hmm. When you're starting out your training, sorry, uh, starting out your learning, mm -hmm. I think AMBOSS is a great resource. That's just my personal opinion. I used Rx as well, which is great. Mm -hmm. And then I used Amboss and I used UWorld. So I personally think Amboss is a very, very good learning tool. It has a wonderful library where you practice questions and then you have the resource right next to it. You can review it. So that's something that's very helpful. And it's a great starting question because it's hard. It's challenging. It gives you not so easy or straightforward questions, but slightly convoluted or slightly tricky but that trains your mind to think outside the box. That trains you to not see things as directly, but like in a different light or a different manner. So I think that's a great resource. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to complete it. There's 4,000 questions, so you don't have to complete it. That's more than, I think, more or less the same as you were. So just getting a grasp of Amboss, using some questions and understanding how to solve questions and build that tempo. And then after that, when you feel comfortable, then you should transition to UWorld. Mm -hmm. And above all, I highly, highly recommend make sure to give the practice tests, which are the NBMEs, the National Board of Medical Examiners, early on. I think everyone should give an NBME after having completed 30% of UWorld. Everyone should give an NBME mm -hmm. just to see their baseline. So that's in terms of the resources. I think that's... Yeah, that's the best resources I can recommend. I highly, highly, highly recommend people who are in fourth year to start studying it as soon as possible and try to get it done by final year, like early final year, if you can get it done because it's pass fail, get do your best, finish the resources, just get it done. So that way in your final year, you, you can actually start focusing on the things which are now being given more weightage, which is start applying for rotations start getting into you know electives or be involved in a research project and you know that's what helps so like for example um when i was in third year i was very actively involved in research i did research with one of my professors his name is dr rashid Usmani, the vascular surgeon associate professor 
So I started being actively involved with research. So one day a week or maybe two days a week, we would sit down and we would discuss important cases and then he would give him topics and then we would just work on that or I would come and share to him and observe him. I think that's something very, very important as well because we get so caught up into studying for these exams for months and months that mm-hmm. it drains you out, it burns you out, it makes you feel demotivated and sad. And that's not what medicine is about. It's more than just exams. It's about really loving what you do, talking to patients, understanding, examining, finding diseases, and learning more about that. So with the step one pass and fail, I think students can now take the time to really focus on research, elective, their clinicals. And I know it's easier said than done, but just having the mindset where you don't have to worry about step one is going to be a huge, huge benefit. So getting it done early by what I suggest is by fourth year would be an excellent way for a person to have a really good final year where they can actually take the time to do rotations and even focus on step two. And with this pass fail over here, I've been attending a lot of program directors. I'm also on the committee for the residency programs where we sit and discuss. I'm just a very, very junior level member. I just sit and we listen to them. I don't have any say in programs. I don't have any say in the residency selection. I just listened to them. And now they're saying that with the step one becoming pass fail, step two's weightage is going to increase. And that is the trend. So step one is significantly harder than step two. That's just clear cut fact. Step two is much more clinically oriented and less convoluted. It's practical. So that is something which I would recommend. In your final year, you can study for the step two really, really well and score very well. A safe bet would be to score a 250 plus you talked about electives so what is the best way to get electives okay so there's three ways to go about it one is that you officially start looking up at university hospitals or these um, clinical rotations uh web like websites of the official hospitals and you start emailing their committees like you email the coordinator you email the elective person you ask them some have official pathways where you apply for the elective the prerequisite is you have to give step one and you need to send them your score and you have to pay the fee. That's the one. The second thing which is moving more is the VSLO program, which is the visiting student learning opportunity. That is something which a lot of medical schools have incorporated where you reach out to your coordinator, whoever is the person in charge of it, and they can help you out with that. They will reach out to the coordinators and they will, you know, find a position. The Third situation, I think, is just context, where if you know someone or you can, you know, connect with someone who has done a rotation, they can refer you to someone. That's the best way. But I think emails are probably really, really, really useful. Just having a CV, being direct. Hi, my name is XYZ. I'm a medical student. I'm interested in this field. I would really love to come and do a rotation with you. I would appreciate it if you would allow me this opportunity. And, you know, just seeing where it goes, trying to email as many faculty members, as many professors and as many people as possible increases your chances of getting in. I think emails are the best way to get about it. Email as many faculty, staff members. If you have any faculty in your own home program in your university or medical school, asking them, excuse me, professor, do you know anyone in the United States who is a friend, who is a colleague or anyone? who you might be able to refer me to, that's an option. Second option is reaching out to as many professors, staff members, faculty, their emails are given, just asking them that, hey, my name is XYZ, I'm a medical student, I really appreciate your work, I'm very interested in learning about cardiology, endocrinology, rheumatology, whatever, and I would love to come and rotate with you and observe with you. And it really helps if you have given your step one as well, so that also shows them that you're focused and you're driven. Not always a requirement, but that's something that helps. Mm -hmm. For university programs, it's a bit challenging because they like to do things in a more systematic manner. Mm -hmm. So you have to email the coordinator, get the details, and pay the fees. So that's something that is challenging. And the last case scenario, if you don't have success in any three of these, Mm -hmm. but it's important that you try, the last case scenario is that there's these organizations called, like, ACE or Brooklyn, USC, or 
I think even AMO, I'm not really sure. I haven't used any of these. Some of my colleagues have used it. So they charge, give you a rotation, they give you a, uh, I think they help you with housing, but they, I'm not 100% sure you'll have to, like whoever is doing that, you'll have to look into that more. But these third party uh, options are also available. You have also done a research position at Mayo Clinic. What is the process of applying for that? So I think it's the same situation for electives. You have to email, email, email. I emailed hundreds of professors and I got like 12 replies. Out of hundreds, 12 replies. Most of them were no's. They were like, no, we require more commitment or we appreciate you, but we don't have any openings right now or um, we can't do remote. So a lot of programs will not allow you to do remote. So you have to come here and do it. The other option is, you know, constantly emailing people and just asking them for an opportunity. And third, I think it really helps if you have some experience as well, because if you have more experience, people will be more willing to accommodate you. You are someone who is very, very basic to research. That really depends on the attending as well uh, or the research uh, doctor, if they're willing to teach you because they want someone who has some experience. That's why I highly recommend students to start learning about the basics of research mm -hmm. early, you know, during their medical school years. Reach out to faculty members, attend a workshop, just start trying. But there's no hard and fast rules. Some of my colleagues have joined here who have not done any USMLEs. They came here, they started research for the first time. I think it just really depends on your attitude, which is, are you someone who's willing to learn? Are you someone who's willing to improve and just willing to commit? So sending emails to faculty members with the purpose of doing a research program, joining with them for one year or two years and you know, your goals need to align. You don't need to do surgery research if you're planning on doing medicine. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if it's in your field of interest, that's perfect. The only challenge is that majority of times these positions are unfunded. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to accept the fact that sometimes you might need to carry that, uh, well, I wouldn't say a burden, it's an investment if you think about it, because you're going to be living in the United States and be paying rent and be taking care of your um, foundation, your food and your housing. So it can be a bit costly. If you can't afford it, then it's definitely a challenging situation. But just to give you a rough estimate, it's around about, depending on the city as well, it's around $1,500 a month to more or less take care of everything or 2000 at max, $2,000. <clears throat> And now divide that by a year. So it's almost about $25,000 of mm -hmm. an investment. And the thing is that they often request, request you that when you're applying for research and if you secure the position, they request you that we need a bank statement mm -hmm. to give you the visa because they don't want you to come here and then have difficulty struggling or you know, mm -hmm. come here and then feel like you're in a financial problem. Mm -hmm. So... Emailing programs is very, very important to get research. Some programs are funded from the beginning, okay? But those are like two or three year programs. So, but also there is this thing as well, where some program, uh, you know, research program say that in the beginning, the first few months are gonna be unpaid and then afterwards we can switch you to a paid position. So I think just having very clear um, motives and having clear communication where you ask them, can you please tell me, what is the situation going to be? How long till I am on a funded position? What are the protocols? And what will my role be? So being as clear and as straightforward as you can be regarding expectations, goals, and ultimately, you know, switching off the position from unpaid to paid. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's very, very important. Another doctor who came on the podcast mentioned the same thing that for every hundred emails you send, at least two people will reply or one person mm -hmm. will reply. Yeah, no. I applied to almost 200 programs. I got 13 responses and of those 13 responses, three people interviewed me, two people offered me a job. So that's, that's how much. Yeah. yeah, 100%. Every day, wake up, send emails, try, try, try. Yeah. And here's the thing that my best friend told me about. You can't wait for the perfect time. You shouldn't expect that, you know, I'm going to start applying after I'm in final year or I'm in 
done with my steps or I've graduated, just start emailing. And then once you get the response, then set a goal. So I got done with my step one in September. I started emailing programs in November. Mm -hmm. Emailing every day, every day for a month, I would send out 20, 20 emails. And <clears throat> in December, I started getting callbacks like, hey, sure, we have, we can interview you. Sorry, we don't have answers. We don't have a position available. So after a while, you know, some people started responding. And I think in December, I had three interviews. So one of them said that he will keep me on as a backup if one person fails to join. Mm -hmm. Another person said that we can have an interview. And then we had the interview and he liked me and he said he would like to hire me on. I said, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. But I had a third interview lined up as well. So I said, I would like to have some time to think about it. So the third, they also liked me and they said that we would like to hire you. But I asked them, okay, can you tell me is it going to be a paid position or unpaid position? Or is it going to be how long of a time commitment? They said that it's going to be a two-year minimum and it will be a funded position, but we need a two-year commitment. Mm -hmm. So that's how it helped. And this was all while I was in medical school. My final prof was in March. And by December or January, I had already sent out 200 emails and I had gotten three responses. And by January, I made my decision to pursue the Mayo Clinic opportunity. I said it clear with my attending that I have my final exams in March. I will be done in May and I have my step two right after that. And then I will come and join in June. He said, okay, that sounds good. So just having clear cut plans and what's going to happen really, really helps. After you're done with your step one and step two and all of your other ERAS requirements and everything, then comes the match day. So what if someone goes unmatched? What are the next steps? I think the first step after going unmatched is definitely taking some time to process it. You don't have to, you know, immediately start worrying about what's going to happen. It's definitely a challenging situation. So taking taking at least half a day, you've been through a a challenging situation and you're not expected to get back and start focusing on it really. I understand that the post soap application is also something that's right there, but I think, you know, just acknowledging the fact that this is a difficult situation and taking a moment and not being hard on yourself because you did your best, but it's okay. This was not your time. So that's something I would like to start off with. Yes, you're Everyone who applies for the match is a qualified, amazing, excellent individual. Mm -hmm. And by no means, if they don't match, should that undermine themselves. Everyone has a different shot. Everyone has a different chance. And sometimes there are factors which are out of your control. So just acknowledging that will put you in a different mindset. Mm -hmm. So moving on from that, I think when you're un in an unmatched situation, you have one of two options. One either you can choose to continue on in the soap or two you can choose to you know take a break and <clears throat> try to do something else which is look for research positions or you can do that even after um you know if you don't match soap so once the soap applications so here's the timeline of after you match monday is match day if you don't match then i think after maybe two hours, the post-soap application, post -soap applications open and the programs which went unfilled are available. There's also two types of matches. There's partially matched, partially unmatched, mm -hmm. or completely unmatched. So for those people who are applying to competitive specialties like neurosurgery, radiology, or dermatology, ophthalmology, <clears throat> Those are completely separate positions. Those are advanced positions, which start as a PGY2, postgraduate year two. And you have to secure a first year position, which is a PGY1 year. It's important that you realize you need to ultimately be prepared for what's going to be happening. Uh, I think PGY1 positions are not too difficult to secure in the post match. So I think you can definitely reach out to programs and during the SOAP match, like through applications. You can't reach out to any program personally. That's a match violation. So I think 
once the soap starts, you start researching applications and you start looking at programs where you think you have a realistic chance, you know, internal medicine, surgery. If any of your colleagues or residents are in that program and that program went, uh, like has spots available, you can definitely ask them like, hey, I'm planning on applying. Can you tell me what's the chances of me getting in? And then they can help you with that. Once the SOAP application starts, you start researching programs and you start looking for possible openings and positions available. You apply to them as you would regularly in the programs, and then you create a new personal statement. You can assign letters, you can sign programs, and then see how it works. Uh, personally, the best piece of advice is shorten your personal statement and then just, you know, be prepared and see what happens. If someone is in the program, they can recommend you. That's not a violation. But I think it really, really is a very tricky situation. So I would definitely read up on the match violations for anyone who's going to be applying in the match. And, you know, it's always best to be prepared. Nobody wants to go into the soap, but being unprepared is a more difficult situation. There is one thing that oftentimes people question. Do they want to change their field of interest or do they want to continue going? So I think that is a personal choice. If you just want to get a job and you want to come here and then you will figure something out, of course, go for it. But I think if you want to take on the challenge of continuing to push for your specialty, what you want to do, what you see yourself doing, then it's a bit more, you know, work to be put in on your end, but it's definitely much more rewarding. What are the chances of getting into your specialty after soaping into a different specialty? For example, if you want to go into surgery and you get a soap position in internal medicine. So do you think that it affects the chances of getting into surgery later on? I think it definitely changes your circumstances because now you're in a medicine position. It also depends. Did you secure a preliminary medicine or did you secure a categorical medicine? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have done this. They've switched, switched specialties but this is what a lot of colleagues, you know, from Pakistan and other national countries have done. For us to match into comparative specialties, it's very challenging. So they often at times do this where they match into internal medicine and, you know, they work really hard to become American board graduates. And then after that, they, uh, what's it called, do the waiver jobs, which is after you're done with your training, you do two to three years and you secure the green cards. And then after that, they become citizens and then they reapply in their different specialties. So it's a very long road, but it really depends on what you want. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people do that and they're able to get into very competitive specialties like dermatology or radiology or even neurosurgery. So mm -hmm. that's the way it is done as well. Mm -hmm. But um, it's definitely challenging to switch after a specialty you know one person who did it they matched into a internal medicine program and then after their first year they made the switch to join uh, radiology so they were able to do that and it worked out well mm -hmm. but it's a challenging situation because you're essentially leaving the program and you need the support of a mentor and someone who's going to help you and you know just asking them that hey i just don't feel like being here i don't want to be in this situation it's a risky situation. It's a complicated. So it really depends on what you want and how open and communicative you are director. Uh, what do you think is the best way to shortlist programs? I was reading up on the website and they said that you can shortlist, I think, 45 programs when you're applying for the SOAP application, if I'm not wrong. So what is the best way to shortlist those programs? So what I did was that I looked at all the programs which had historically taken IMGs, number one. And number two, I also looked for them in the cities where there was a higher chance of IMGs matching to so like mm -hmm. New York or Michigan or Florida or I'm trying to think what else. There's a bunch of other states as well, which are relatively more IMG friendly. Massachusetts is also a bit IMG friendly as well. So these states, they tend, tend to have more positions. I think New York is probably the biggest one. So finding programs there and here can help. And at the same time, there's like opportunities available wherever, be it preliminary medicine, preliminary surgery, you should apply everywhere. Definitely save those programs for those 
which have taken IMGs, but you can find the roster where they have the postings. And if you know, you see the IMGs with their medical schools outside the US, that's helpful. Not all programs will have that listed, so it will be a bit challenging, but <clears throat> sometimes in the program's website, they have mentioned that we have taken IMGs, we take IMGs, we sponsor. The visa sponsorship message is a bit tricky because a program can sponsor J1, but that doesn't mean that they'll take IMGs. Mm -hmm. So there are programs which say we mentioned, we sponsor J1s, but they're completely American board. So that's a difficult situation. I think you just need to do your research before shortlisting programs to increase your chances. And I think the biggest thing to be honest, Nusha, is just knowing the right people because so much of medicine here is your hard work and your commitment but even more so it's about knowing the right people the connections the mentors that you make people who are willing to pick up the phone make a phone call for you and reach out on your behalf because that is the biggest thing that is why i'm so in favor of reaching out connecting with mentors reaching out to seniors asking them and keep in mind not everyone will be accommodating some will be be like course how can i help some will be like you know i will try but as the math cycle is becoming more and more competitive you really need people who can support you and who will have your back so having very clear-cut instruct not instructions sorry clear-cut ideas of what a mentorship is like yeah. is something that's helpful and i think the biggest thing is just overcoming the fear that what will happen if i ask them can you help me they'll say no Mm -hmm. so it's it's a lot to be taken into there's no harm in reaching out in a nice way absolutely not and you'll have to reach out to a lot of people before someone is willing to be like of course i will help you but also you have to prove to someone that they're worth your they, you are worth their time as well that's where i believe you know research mentorship commitment it all comes into it's like an investment in yourself and of course not everyone can take on this adventure and i completely understand that but I definitely think that people can work hard and just reach out in any and every way possible. Mentors from back home, mentors from different programs, mentors from seniors and you know fellow co-residents, colleagues, anything and everything that helps helps. So what are the next steps after this? Do you have to apply for the match again or do you stay at the same program? What are the next steps? So for me, I'm a transitional year resident. So I rotated in a different programs. This is something that's really useful, but also something that not every program has. You have the opportunity to go into electives. So I'm doing electives in programs which have residency programs to get a chance to meet them and say hello and introduce myself mm -hmm. to reapply. So that's something that's very helpful as well. Secondly, I'm reaching out to more of my mentors and colleagues and having them make calls and help me and you know, see what happens. So there's two pathways. One, sometimes during this uh, math cycle, uh, during the year, course of the year, new positions become available or certain residents leave the program. Mm. So they have those positions available. And in those staff situations, you can reach out to the coordinator. You can tell them that, hey, <clears throat> I'm a resident completing my first year. I will be done in this time. Your position is starting this year. I believe I can join. I can accept the program. Or, you know, if it's a categorical, they can even be like, yes, I can join, I can switch, or it's just a very challenging situation. But being on the lookout for programs that become available, that's where the role of the ERAS, sorry, um, what's it called? There's these uh, pages on Instagram and Twitter, mm -hmm. which focus on posting, I think it's called Inside the Match. That's a very useful one. And another a bunch of other IMG medical pages on Twitter. I also really, really recommend every medical student who's watching this to make a Twitter account and be active. Showcase yourself. Put the Pakistani flag in your title. <laughs> Show that you want to connect and that will really help you bring more people together. So just seeing, look, keeping a lookout for those positions that are available is really, really helpful. And not only that, other than that, just the main match. You apply again. This time, when you're in a position, you have the support of your director, you have the support of a few of your attendings, and it definitely has yielded much more positive results. Not saying it always works out, but always having a backup of what you can do. 
whether do you want to stay in the same specialty, do you want to switch to a different specialty, you know, that's something that's always a possible option. And I think the third thing that I really want to emphasize a lot upon, especially for a lot of those people who are unable to take on these financial adventure, adventures and really want to make it here. I've seen many, many of my colleagues and professors and attendants who are, uh, you know, internationals from India, from Egypt, from Turkey, they have completed their own home country residencies, which is easier to get into. It's not that challenging. And they've taken the time during the residencies to complete their step one, step two, step three, and have received ECFMG certification. And then they come here and they get the fellowships. Fellowships are so much more easier to get into than residency. And above all, the fellowships, they offer you an H1 visa, which is the green card visa. So that is something whoever is watching your podcast who wants to pursue a career in the United States, definitely look at this. It's called the alternative pathway. You do your own home country residency and then you come here for fellowship when you are already certified because that makes the job of the training committee easier. They don't have to train you as hard. Mm -hmm. So, and you can get into the most competitive specialty. I know people who have done neurosurgery from their home country. They came here for fellowships and now they are, they are hired on as staff. Radiology, I've seen so many of my colleagues who are certified from their home countries, did their home country residencies, came here for a fellowship or two fellowships. They had done their steps and everything. And after their fellowship, they were hired on as staff or they were given opportunities. It's amazing that how this is so much more straightforward and easier and definitely not financially crippling as well. Because mm. you get earning or you, you do your work in your own home country. The only thing you have to pay for is your step exams. And apart from that, once you get the program, you get the fellowship, you get everything, just the flight and payment ticket. And that's it. And you'll be paid a salary of a fellow, which is much more than that of a resident. That's a very good point. Thank you for highlighting that because I think a lot of people do not know about this. Okay? Yeah, that, that's something I noticed as well. So many of my colleagues over here do this alternative pathway. I was sitting with an attending the other day who even brought this up that it's so much more easier and so much more straightforward. And then they come here and they more or less don't have to worry about anything. They just get their fellowships done. And then if they're very good, they're nice and there's a requirement, they get jobs. Mm -hmm. It's so much more easier. That's great. So how do you see the future of medicine 50 years from now? Hmm. I think definitely much more patient-centered, which is folk tailor-made medicine, tailor-made surgical procedures, best fitting for the patient and minimizing this risk of side effects. Secondly, I really feel like the role of 3D printing, 3D uh, procedures, sorry, 3D printing to get a better idea of the tumor, the procedure to be done, the anatomy, that way you can minimize the risk of complications and you can really understand how best to target the problem I also really believe in uh, what's it called focused targeted therapy, which is minimally invasive as well, where that's where I feel as though more and more role of uh, these robotic procedures being skilled in robotic procedures, that's going to be very, very useful. And also I'm seeing a lot of AI, which is artificial intelligence. These are softwares that can help uh, physicians make decisions and minimize the thinking time. But there won't ever be a fear of replacement because it's not going to be, uh, what's it called, that major thing. The de these devices, these procedures, these robots, they're all there to help humans. So mm -hmm. you will always have a need for a physician who's a human, and you can use these resources to help you to the best of your capabilities. So with that being said, I don't think there's anyone should have any fear that I'm going to pursue a specialty which will, you know, run out after a few years or be replaced by uh, robots or AI. There's always going to be a need of good, hardworking patients because at the end of the day, I myself as a patient would like to talk to a human rather than a machine who just tells me, you have this problem, you need to take this medication and you will be fine. That's pretty much it. And I think just, I think a lot of it's going to involve a lot more technology. And I think more and more focused, tailor-made medications, surgical procedures, which are best suited for a patient. Not everything is going to be like 
you know, slicing a slice, slicing a pizza, everyone gets an equal piece. Now you have to cut it. You have to do it in a certain way according to a person's preference, choice, and making it the best procedure or the best slice of pizza for them. I hope that we can see all of those advances in medicine. I think that brings us to the end of our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that everyone watching will find this helpful. Thank you so much for coming. Of course. Thank you so much, Anshian. Thank you.